One day last winter, some American friends and myself set off to seek the first men. Our objective? To reach some of the world's oldest paleontological sites in the delta of the Omo River and the southern tip of Ethiopia, East Africa. The Omo expedition will last 21 days. We will see nothing during that time except for a muddy river hemmed in by two mountain ranges. To keep us going these three weeks, we take along rations and equipment stowed in inflatable waterproof bags which are meant to be unsinkable. Only the wash of the river keeps us rolling on. There is no turning back. We are the river's captives. For many long days, the only living beings we see are hippos. Whole tribes of them. And a few nilotic crocodiles, the largest in the world. Ten thousand years ago, the river we are going down was a tributary of the Nile. It was from here, perhaps two million years ago, that early man set off north to people the world. The chief obstacles to settling in the Omo Valley, a basalt rock terrain, mountains and swarms of tsetse flies. These large flies with their crossed wings are carriers of that awesome disease known as sleeping sickness, which takes thousands of lives every year, even today in East Africa. We will pitch camp each evening on the sandbanks vacated by the hippos. There, we sometimes catch catfish, which becomes our daily feed. Barbuses of the Silurus type, electric catfish and African lungfish are veritable living fossils. As for the water, it's delicious. We're at the end of the rainy season. We will go down 500 miles of river in a series of drops, in a heat that stifles us by degrees, against a backdrop of vegetation comprising of wild fig trees, tropical lianas and banyan trees with their myriad trunks growing down to the ground like props. This is the land of the colobus, the Ethiopian goreza monkey with its splendid fur and rudder tail. Monkeys whose habitat is the treetops of the open forest and which, swinging from tree to tree, can travel faster than we can on the ground. In our rubber rafts, especially designed to stand up to rapids, and particularly reefs, we topple down the river as if we're falling downstairs, a drop of nearly 700 feet a day. The Omo Valley remains one of the areas in the world where man does not dominate, and where animals, and especially plant life, burst forth in freedom. Now this day, one of our boats gets caught in a little whirlpool. Well, that looked harmless enough. Fortunately, our gear was battened down, but four members of our team took a 20-foot plunge to the bottom of the river. And there, at last, the first man appeared, at an altitude of 2,500 feet. We have just penetrated the territory of the Nilotic peoples, also called Nilo-Saharans. The Bume, the Bodhi, and the Mursi live in one of Africa's most isolated and most inaccessible regions, a truly forgotten country. The 
peoples of the Omo have only been known to us for a few years. So the Mursi are just as curious to see us as we to meet them. <laughs> who are they? Men and women who came from the West, from the Saharan regions, perhaps 6,000 years ago when the Sahara was turning into a desert. <laughs> Since time began, men, and perhaps women even more so, have sought to stand out from nature. Hence the use of tattooing and the jewelry made of bone, wood, or feathers. But Mursi women devise the idea of stretching their lips. They fit into the lip a clay disc, which is replaced by a bigger and bigger one, a heavier and heavier one as the years go by. The greatest care being taken, however, not to split the lip. That would be a great humiliation. These discs, which for them are real works of art, can reach diameters of six or seven inches. Size is in direct proportion to prestige. This form of mutilation is an inconvenience when they speak, and even more so when they eat or go to sleep. But such is the price of beauty. <laughs> As we meandered down the river from camp to camp, the riverside dwellers fled into the forest only to come back most cautiously. But after a few hours, they grew more confident and would then start to cage razor blades from us. For another stylishness wants men to have skin which is as smooth as the palm of their hand, except for a crown of hair looking like a skull cap. Every day, they recreate fire by rubbing a piece of hardwood in the vein of a piece of softwood. At what period did man realize that by rubbing two pieces of wood together, or two flints, he could set a light to twigs in a matter of minutes? An operation requiring great skill, and yet in the south of Europe, traces of a hearth 400,000 years old has been found. But actually, creating fire was an invention of paramount importance in the fight against darkness, the hardening of wooden tools, the protection against wild animals, the exercising of fear, and the taking of a honeycomb from the hollow trunks of large trees. But man also stood out from the animal world by inventing tools traps to hunt with, and those implements for agriculture. When the rain stops, the water level in the river goes down and silt is deposited on the banks. It's then that the fields have to be tidied up. This man is poking his wooden stick in the ground at an angle so as not to compact the soil. A woman follows. A seed is dropped in the hole and covered up. The birth of agriculture. This was 11,000 years ago. Intelligent and devious, man was also the inventor of traps. Innumerable traps for group or lone hunting. A few wisps of reeds, a supple branch and some thread. This sophisticated snare will perhaps get a bird. The four or five.
The four or five thousand Mursi who live in the Omo Valley are semi-sedentary. They spend the rainy season in the savanna with their herds and only come back to these straw hut villages for the sorghum, millet and tobacco harvests. Agriculture generated the social organization that may still be witnessed today. Whilst the man hunts and looks after the farm animals, the woman goes picking, grows crops or takes care of the children. Agriculture produced sedentary communities that have made it possible to hoard grain, honey and cured meat in lofts and calabashes. When he throws his wooden spear with its steel harpoon tip, the fisherman often misses his target owing to the muddy waters. But time is of no account, and sooner or later you can be sure he will catch a catfish. He also hunts crocodiles with poisoned lances. So many fishing techniques have been devised. Nets, baits, or poisons. A gesture basic to the survival of mankind. The sharing of food within the group. The men and the women separate, no doubt. Here develop solidarity, a spirit of communion, and also language. Everything which since prehistoric times has led to the survival and development of mankind. Our journey, however, through time and space, is to be a long one. We are traveling towards Egypt and the sea, thousands of years, thousands of miles apart. Leaving the Bumei on one bank, the Bodhi and the Mursi on the other, we learn something of our past that perhaps we had forgotten. The most recent paleontological discoveries have shown that man was born here in this region of Africa. The Omo, the Turkana, Hadar in Ethiopia, Kubifora in Kenya. From this area, perhaps as much as two million years ago, he went north, peopling Asia, Europe, and also the rest of Africa, the whole of the Old World. And why would he have not followed the Nile Valley? 10,000 years ago, the Omo and the Turkana flowed into the Blue Nile. It then took two million years for civilizations to get organized. Napata and Meroe in northern Sudan, the kingdom of Kush, referred to in the Bible. The Lake Turkana saga began here on these banks in 1967. This is the Kubi Fora dig, where sediments and fossils of animals and hominids were literally piled up 3,000 feet down. One of the most important paleontological sites discovered by an Anglo Kenyan scientist, Richard Leakey. Uncovered by diggings or erosions, these vestiges lie thick upon the sediment. We are treading more than two million years of history. Here the mandible of a hominid or of an extinct mammal. There a flint chip, a rough tool, deliberately carved by the most archaic of our ancestors ever discovered, the Australopithecus, studied by specialists in Kubifora. Fossil evidence by the thousand like these skulls, crocodile, hippopotamus, hipparion, the ancestor of the horse, zebra, species both living and extinct. This femur belongs to an extinct race of gigantic elephants, four times the size of the present day one. These remains discovered on the surface are two million years old. We come to an upright man, Homo erectus. A remarkable tool dating back to Paleolithic times. Early man fashioned himself very effective tools. First of all, the slightly adjusted rudimentary stone, then the chopper, where symmetry is already attained, the crusher, the axe, a tool and a weapon to be reckoned with. 
He used these tools for hundreds of thousands of years whilst man in just a few recent centuries went from the steel hammer to the interplanetary spaceship. Both habilis and erectus. Perfect medstone tool that can be used. Australopithecus had a receding forehead. He can be recognized by the sagittal crest rising from the top of the skull. This species was not quite a man, but he did stand upright like the celebrated Lucy, discovered in Ethiopia to have an age of three and a half million years. Then came Homo habilis, one million five hundred thousand years ago. He was discovered in Kenya, the first genuine representative of the human species. Then Homo erectus, discovered in Africa, Europe, Asia, the first great nomad, dating back to between three hundred thousand and one and a half million years the direct ancestor of Homo sapiens, man as we know him today, with a highly developed brain. The species to which the Cro-Magnon man belonged, and the inventor of the Lascaux paintings in the south of France. East African cave art is doubtless more recent, but almost as surprising as the Lascaux paintings. Naturalistic, with its herds of antelopes, symbolic, with its lanky figures. Dialogue with a crack in the rock, a pipe player, the reed stem, one of the oldest musical instruments in the world. A kidnapping scene. And here perhaps the great migration, figures walking, bent forward to depict movement, and a long way they went. Hunting elephants and rhinoceroses, early works of art are works of magic. Drawing an animal meant rendering it powerless. Triceratops, the dinosaur man never knew. It was a dinosaur just like Tyrannosaurus. The largest carnivorous animal ever nurtured by the earth. Diplodocus, vegetarian, 80 feet long, 30 tons, with a brain scarcely larger than that of a kitten. The dinosaurs died out, overwhelmed 65 million years ago. That's 650,000 centuries. As the era of the dinosaur dawned, Africa experienced an important cleavage. Torn apart by the continental drift, overheated by subterranean streams of unbelievably powerful hot liquids, the earth burst open, liquefied, bringing about the total collapse of the whole of the eastern continent. This is the Rift Valley, the great African fault, which widens a few millimeters every year. In a few dozen million years, East Africa will be an island. Active or dormant volcanoes spread out along its whole length, while jets of steam and the bubble of hot springs bear witness to underground activity. In Lake Bogoria in Kenya, where no other forms of animal life could exist, flamingos have found a unique ecological slot. In these alkaline waters, enormous concentrations of blue algae feed whole populations of small shellfish, thus causing the proliferation of two million flamingos of two different species. The bird's beak lets the food through and filters out the toxic water, an extraordinary feat of adaptation to a harsh environment. Animal species often adapt and specialize. They are therefore vulnerable, while man has settled on ice, in the forests, in the deserts, in the mountains. Animals forsake the weak, the wounded. The Great Rift Valley stretches over 6,000 miles from the Red Sea to Mozambique. An overheated land, but a land made fertile by a covering of volcanic ash sediment. a place of choice for African wildlife.
Here can be seen an incredible concentration of Grant's gazelles, impalas, bubal antelopes, topis, and zebras, whose hearing is so keen that the movement of a predator, be it a lion or a leopard, can be heard some hundred yards away. Man has intelligence going for him. Animals are often gifted with fine hearing, strength, agility, or speed. from the first was a hunter. Hunting induced him to devise techniques, tricks, and weapons. Hunting was to free man of some of his fears whilst establishing relationships of a magical nature with the elements. Doubtless, hunting was also man's first group activity. The Azandi tribe in southern Sudan today still uses a hunting technique which must date back to the Stone Age. One of this tribe's customs is regularly to set fire to the savanna so as to drive the animals into nets held taut between trees. Some 20,000 years ago, men were performing these very same acts. Much hustle, great destruction, and all for a result totally disproportionate to the vegetation burnt. A few marsh rats, called agoutis. Generally speaking, women do not take part in game hunting nowadays any more than they did in prehistoric times. It was thus, very early on, that the idea of setting up camps where women would be able to have shelter and take care of children and old folk developed. This is when the first social relationships came into being. Protective, friendly relationships, which were to have a determining influence on the fate of mankind. Among the huts and lofts built on piles, women and children bustle about. But any time a man goes by, it is with such dignity, it's as if he were the lord of the universe. Polygamy is still the rule. It goes along with wealth and social contacts. Women work in the fields and build the huts. A large, a very large family, for example 20 to 30 children, is a token of health and a promise of prosperity. On a wedding day, a daughter is worth 50 head of cattle or so, and a groom, prestige. Among these ethnics of the Upper Nile, such as the Turkana, a good wife gives expression to her beauty, hence the basic importance, since the beginning of time, of adornments and jewels. It is also the woman's task to prepare meals. They cook the sorghum broth, grill goat's meat, ferment milk in cow's urine.
For the Kenyan Samburu people, the red men, jewels are just as important, and their hair shines with a mixture of butter and clay. The diet of the younger age group, the so-called warriors, is an almost exclusive diet of milk and blood, seldom meat. Warriors go through an apprenticeship in secret, far from the settlement and onlooking women. There in the dry season camp, they often mix she-camel's blood and milk. They draw the blood by sticking a dart into the vein in the neck. is collected and stirred to prevent it coagulating. The wound is closed, clogged up with sand. The camel is then turned out with the herd. Milk and blood, noble foodstuffs, and a major contributor of protein in the bad season. <laughs> it is thanks to practices of this kind that humanity has borne up over the centuries, surviving drought, shortage, famine. <laughs> Consuming the blood has become a rite for the Samburu, reserved to initiates. Children and women are turned away. According to the symbolic laws, the red of blood symbolizes matter, and the white of milk, the spirit. The whole of Africa is divided into a host of tribes, over 70 in the Sudan alone, speaking languages which are sometimes totally different. Such diversity stems from the fact that the communities were isolated over the centuries by the mountains, the deserts, the forests, the lakes, and there were innumerable migrations. According to the tradition of Nilotic peoples, some 1,000 years ago, perhaps, pastoral folk came from the east, the heights of Ethiopia. Some brought with them their livestock and settled as leading aristocracy in kingdoms. Others became nomads with neither chiefs nor laws in the virgin tracks of present-day Uganda, Kenya, and the Sudan. The Taposa settled but scarcely 200 years ago in the south of the Sudan. Tall, slim, like all the Nilotic people, somewhat shy, they live in a society with no leaders, though organized in age categories, or rather, a hierarchy of generations. <laughs> At the top, the aged members of the group who have retired, the patriarchs, the custodians of knowledge and honorary power, a whole class of wise men, of priests, in touch with the Great Spirit. Neither servant nor master, but on the contrary, an extraordinary spirit of brotherhood within a single generational group. Day in, day out, they adorn each other's hair and beard with vegetable dyes. They take each other on at Nicolese, a game where the 96 pebbles representing head of cattle have to be taken from one's opponent.
At the lower level in society, adults at the prime of life are the holders, not of knowledge, but of real power. And then the young men, the warriors. Finally, the children, who impatiently await the honor of moving one step forward. In the clearing, they are preparing a transfer of power ceremony, Nayake Damdam, the full moon celebration. Ivory balls, ostrich feathers, opal necklaces, each row of beads cost several heads of cattle. The dress spears are ornamented with bright colors. Some warriors have rows of scarification over their shoulders. Each line corresponds to an enemy killed. At daybreak, the women go down in a procession to the riverbed. Last night, the moon was full, lighting up the whole sky. The great day has come. The Toposa have an explanation for the universe. It is divided up into higher and lower regions. Formerly, human beings cohabitated with the Great Spirit, but they could only come down to Earth with the help of a rope, looped over the moon. One day, a woman about to give birth came down from heaven, and the rope broke under her weight. Since that time, we have been chained to the Earth, threatened by disease, looting famine, an African transposition of original sin. On this day when powers are transferred, the warrior class is on alert. Ostrich feathers inserted into large rings burst forth from their hair. Makeup, leopard or colobus skin ornaments, white adornments, ennobling body motions. This is a war parade. Nayake Dam Dam, the ceremony assimilated to initiation celebrations, rites of passage. Initiation for a generation of the tribe's males attended by the women. Part of the honors will be shared by them. Thus, with their shields and spears, they symbolically exalt strength and combat. <laughs>
this group of men to be initiated, to cross this fundamental threshold of a generation, means moving into a world where others are excluded. It is in whole age groups, in totally united blocks, that the Toposa warriors lead their frequent cattle rustling expeditions to the territories of neighboring tribes, or wage war with the Turkana, the Lotuko, or the Murle, their blood brothers, but also their perennial enemies. In the eyes of the Toposa, God created the world for their sake. Looting is therefore permitted and even encouraged, since it enables the tribe to recover what in fact belongs to it. All the weapons, all the cattle, all the women in the world belong to them. So a war parade is more than symbolic in nature. What else is it, indeed, than a collective conditioning to give the warriors a taste for raids, to apprise them of the virtues of aggressivity, which sometimes survival of the clan depend on? Formerly, the forest covered the whole of Africa, even the Sahara. The Rift Valley breach convulsed the environment, broke up climatic conditions, brought much of the region's wealth to nothing. Deforestation by the hand of man, if he only has hand tools at his disposal, is almost negligible when compared with the forces of nature. In the dense forests of Rwanda, Uganda and Zaire, not far from the southernmost sources of the Nile, the volcanic area vies with the Ruwenzori mountain range over the name Mountains of the Moon. A vegetation almost larger than life, arborescent ferns, lobelia, senecia, hypericum, hygienia trees with their contorted branches weighed down by moss and lichens. It could be another planet. the secret lair of the last great mountain gorillas, our distant cousins, biologically speaking. Paleontologists say that 30 million years ago, large apes and ourselves had a common ancestor. Our ancestor lived in the jungle, feeding exclusively on leaves, bark, and fruits. The struggle for survival when the climate got drier made it possible for men to produce nearly five billion individuals. The big gorillas, now down to 500, are confined to their ecological niche, which is gradually drawing in on them. Increasingly, their territory is being cleared and cultivated because we are too numerous. The chimpanzee has also taken refuge in the forest. He never invented sophisticated tools, nor language, neither did he conquer fire. And yet, his biochemical heritage is almost identical to ours, around 98% common genetic points, so the scientists have discovered. Extinct or dormant volcanoes, crater lakes. The whole region is dominated by water, a gigantic sponge gorged with water feeding the innumerable sources of the Nile, including the Mukangwa River in Rwanda. At over 50,000 cubic feet of water per second, this liquid universe reaches the Sudanese Nile. But here the Nile will have to contend with the Sud, which means barrier in Arabic, the biggest marsh in the world. This barrier, totally impassable in the rainy season, eight months a year, 
covers an area of 20,000 square miles and prevented the sources of the Nile being discovered until the 19th century. A sea of green, a magma, a tangle of floating islands and drifting hyacinths. In a fury of proliferation, its weight increasing 10 to 15 percent a day, the water hyacinth hampers boats, hangs on the banks, sometimes stifles the indispensable vegetation for the cattle. But this great marsh is a paradise for the roller, for the crowned crane, the egret, the heron, and over 500 other bird species. too for the crocodile. For the early explorers, the Portuguese, in the 15th and 16th century, hippos reminded them of mermaids. A somewhat hefty mermaid. She may weigh a hundred pounds at birth, over two tons in adulthood. The Nile mermaid has four squat legs, a farcical face, a minute tail, and yet she dies. Hippopotamuses don't swim, as is often thought they actually walk underwater. The Dinkas, the White Nile giants, number over a million, scattered over a territory of 250,000 square miles. They are among the most important tribes in Africa. They are also known as the people of the cow, for they have staked everything on cattle. The twisted horns of their favorite steer are a mode of expression, an art. Warping the horns of the herd's finest heads goes back 5,000 years. This is depicted on rock etchings in the Sahara. Their music, their poems, are scored to the beat of the cattle's hooves. For them, cattle is everything, the font of prestige, milk, blood, which is drunk in periods of famine, dowries for marriages, and gifts to the gods. One exception, a little fishing. The men in the Nile River, the youngsters in the backwater. The spear is thrust into the silt in an attempt to pierce a lungfish, or clarias. In the dry season, this fish with its mustaches, a true living fossil, lies low, right at the bottom of the puddles, waiting for the rainy season. But is it a fish, or rather an amphibian? The Claudius does not have lungs and breathes in the surface air. When it is buried in the mud, then it uses its gills. In the daytime, only a few women, old folk, and children stay at the camp. The grown-up males are herding in the savanna each armed with a staff which has a spear or antelope horn tip. 
Here in the kraal, there only remain the young beasts and six steers. Never is a cow slaughtered, except for rare sacrificial rites. But twice a day, the young cow herds milk them. Milk is the basic foodstuff, flavored with ash or soured in fresh cow's urine. Everyone has specific duties. Some draw up water, others braid leather thongs, sweep the ground for the cattle to lie on, or keep up the dung fires. The dog keeps guard. These youngsters have picked up animal droppings in goat skins and have spread them out to dry. Now they are heaping them on the bonfire where they slowly burn through. The calves are coddled, pampered almost lovingly, dolled up with ash, which will keep off the mosquitoes and the gadflies, gadflies with stings capable of piercing cattle hide. Every man, woman and child among the Dinka is named after his or her favorite animal. A boy might be called Niad Jok, white calf with black spots. A woman Yom, brown cow. Or Yar, white cow. A man, Malek, speckled bull. Majonk, black bull. The Dinka literally identify themselves with their cattle. Every one of them knows scores of names for any one beast. It depends on the shape of its horns, the color of its coat, or the spots on it. When the evening comes and the sun changes color, the shouts of the herdsmen and the blowing of the horns herald the return of the herds. Each animal goes straight to its usual stake where it will find its tether for the night. The men sleep nearby, lying in cow dung and the ashes from the fire. over the camp and calmly the Nile ripples away on its 4,000 mile journey towards Egypt and the sea. This is the time of day when the Silurus leaves its lair of aquatic roots and hyacinths, sometimes the hour of death. With death comes the rebirth of life, for Neolik, the god supreme of the Dinkas, created the world, the fish, the river, day, night, the cattle and man. Thank <laughs> you.